Uh, thanks for joining us today on our short talk on deep causal learning, which is some work that we've been doing in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, Jung is joining me here today, um, who's off screen, and she's going to join for questions later. So if you have any, please shout in the end. Um, let's motivate this though first of like, why do we do causality and what does that mean? So one question that you can think about is really of kind of like, how do we assign certain decisions to um, actions that we want to perform? So for example, we are in a medical scenario where we want to assign treatments to patients. And the question is like, what is the best possible treatment for a patient to optimize the health outcome? Or on the other hand, we can think about a sales scenario where we have certain kind of like um, promotions or kind of like discounts that we can offer to the different customers. And we really want to figure out what can we do so that we maximize the revenue for um, yeah, the company. And one tool that we can use to do that is um, causality where we estimate so-called treatment effects, uh, which are really just estimating this question of what would happen if we do something. And particularly in the sales scenario, we would, for example, say, what's the effect of a given promotion? And there we can then look at uh, an entity called an average treatment effect, which is really just the difference of the average expected outcome of giving a promotion, uh, which is what we see on the left here, versus the average expected outcome of not giving the promotion, which is what we see on the right. And by looking at the difference between those two things, you can then estimate of like how good it is to do those, perform this promotion, and you can then use that for decision making. And in many scenarios, we might want to actually be a bit more specific rather than looking at the full population that you have available you would look at a so-called conditional average treatment effect. And in the sales scenario, for example, we would say, oh, what's the effect of giving this promotion in the UK, in the US, in some other region, or some other kind of like subgroup of your customers. And there, rather than looking just at this interventional distribution and the expected outcome there, you actually then condition on um, some other variable. Um, so formalizing this a bit more, what we actually want to be doing is we have some data. Um, just like observed data that we take. And we want to output a causal graph, so the causal relationships between the different variables, the functional relationships, because having those two things, we can then actually calculate our causal, causal quantities being average treatment effects or conditional average treatment effects or some other things as well. And lastly, once we have them, we can make decisions. So in a lot of causality, we can do causal effect estimation, but that assumes we have a graph given. The question really is, how do we find this graph and how do we then kind of like move forward from there? And this is what we do in causal discovery and this is kind of like one of the main things, main building blocks and some of the work that we've been doing. So there are three general types of causal discovery methods. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, just kind of like talking about uh, one way of thinking about causal models which is the so-called structural causal model or structural equation model framework, where we assume that all of our variables are a function of the parents, our parents' variables in the graph, and some exogenous noise variable. And uh, this is a deterministic function that then just maps one to the other. And one special case are so-called additive noise models, where we say that our variables are functions of the parents plus the noise which is then not in the function anymore, but just added on. And in a very simple linear scenario, you can actually already quite visually show that this is identifiable, meaning you can find the correct direction of your causal graphs and your causal um, relationships. Where, for example, when we look at our examples here, where we have a linear model and some Gaussian noise or some uniform noise, basically what we see is in the Gaussian case, when we regress um, y from x or x from y, we see that there is no difference in the residuals which are plotted as the red dots here. Whereas if we look at the uniform case, we see that in the case where we request y from x, um, our residuals are independent of x and independent of the other variables, whereas in the case where we l try to request x from y, our residuals are not independent anymore. And this is one of the main assumptions that we do in this uh, structural equation model framework that is that the exogenous noise, the residuals basically, should be independent of everything else if there are no latent confounders. 
And this is why we say, oh, X actually causes Y, because this is the direction where we can find um, that the residuals are independent of the other variables. And this is just like a very simple uh, case in looking at linear models and very simple noise distributions. But this is something that you can then generalize to much more complicated functions and distributions. And yeah, meet DESI, our deep end-to-end -end, um, causal inference framework, uh, which we are also presenting a bit more in depth on Friday in the causal machine learning for real-world impact workshop. And basically what we do is exactly that. We have our structure equation model, which is an additive noise model. But rather than F being a linear function, it now becomes a deep neural network uh, which allows us to have much more complicated functional relationships that we can then use to model all types of um, data. And what we then basically try to learn is a latent variable model where we have some distribution of our graph and um, distribution of our variables that factorizes as that. And we can then simply optimize our likelihood um, of the data that we have observed where we use a, in the simplest case, again, Gaussian likelihood if you use um, a Gaussian noise model, but we have more complicated ways of kind of like looking at spline distributions or so on and so forth. But because we use this additive noise model assumption, we can simply transform our observational data into the exogenous noise space. You can think of it as a very simple um, normalizing flow where you kind of like invert um, your um, transformation back into the uh, noise space and can then calculate your likelihood in the actual uh, exogenous noise space rather than having it to do on the observational data and this allows us to learn this end-to-end -end for the functional relationships. Which then brings me to the second part which is a bit more complicated which is how do we actually perform graph learning and graphs are a really um, complicated thing to work with actually when you want to optimize and find the correct graph Luckily, there has been some work recently, a couple of years ago, at published at NURBS as well, that has come up with a continuous constraint that you can um, optimize that um, yeah, allows you to see whether a graph is a DAC or not, because given it's a causal graph, it needs to be directed and acyclic, otherwise you don't have correct causal relationships in there. And we can then use this um, relationship, uh, this DAC constraint to get a um, some loss term to actually learn the functions and the graph. DAC, in their paper, they only looked at linear relationships, whereas we only use the DAC constraint to actually um, enforce a prior on our latent variable that is the graph. So we have a prior that looks like that, um, where we actually enforce sparsity in this first term, which kind of like says we, our graph should be as sparse as possible so that you actually have causal minimality in there, and the other two terms are to enforce the DAC constraint that we actually get um, a DAC as the end result um, of our optimization process. In the inference setting, we then say, let's have a variational distribution over our graph. So we have a, in the simplest case, an independent Bernoulli variable on the edges of our causal relationships, and we can then pluck simple variational inference in there. We um, have an elbow that optimizes the evidence lower bound of our observed data, so um, that we simply use our likelihood as described earlier. We optimize our prior term that shows that we should have a DAC, and together, this then with some cool fancy theory shows that we can actually recover the true distribution and the uh, true DAC if we have um, infinite data and um, the true data generating process is part of the model class that we're considering here, meaning an additive noise model. So by then estimating a posterior over graphs like that, where we basically learn this distribution, which is not just a single DAC because we believe in the limited data case, which is what we have in practice, we cannot necessarily distinguish all possible DACs. We then learn this posterior distribution where we then, for, for example, assign 60% probability to one DAC and only 40% to like a wrong DAC. And um, we would then perform Bayesian model averaging, basically, over the different DACs that we um, consider in our posterior, so that we then have an expected value for our S8 and our Kate. 
um, and we can then actually perform our, our interventions on those DAGs. So for example, if we then want to estimate a treatment effect on this DAG, you would still do our intervention, cut this um, edge, set XT to a certain value, and look at our um, interventional distribution under this intervention with this new mutilated graph. Um, and to actually estimate this over all the graphs and all the um, samples that we have, what we would do is we would sample multiple graphs, do this mutilation, and then from every graph, sample multiple yeah, samples um, from our generative model that we in the end learned. And we can then simply average them using Monte Carlo estimation to get our average treatment effect or potentially our conditional average treatment effect in some settings. However, and this is now um, another problem if you want to have um, some conditional average treatment effect where your conditioning is not necessarily an upstream variable of your outcome. This does not become super easy because you would need to estimate um, base rule to get the um, probabilities out. And this is, as most of you might know, very intractable and like there's been a lot of people looking into that, how to do that. What we do instead is simply train a surrogate model. So what we do is we sample multiple samples from our interventional distribution. We then consider the samples that have the, um, yeah, all of those basically, and then um, learn the surrogate model that predicts the outcome from our conditioning variable. And uh, using this, we can then estimate our CAD using our surrogate model by just plugging our conditioning variable in there. Um, and this works surprisingly well. Um, just looking at a kind of like toy example of, again, kind of like our four variables here and like a two-dimensional case, what we're kind of like looking at. And um, what we do is we have our observational distribution at the top from our yeah, observational data and the true interventional distributions here as well. And on the left, we see the two graphs that we learned. So we assign 60% to the correct graph, 40% to the wrong graph. And what we then do is show the first graph and the kind of like associated data distributions on the top. And on the second one, we show the um, data distributions and interventional distributions to associate with the second graph. And what we first see is obviously uh, both graphs have approximately the same observational distribution, which is why we can't distinguish them properly. Otherwise, we would have found a single graph. Um, however, when we look at the interventional distributions, they are slightly different. And um, we then look at our kind of like surrogate models. So we have um, the orange distribution is our kind of like re reference value for the um, ATE calculation. And green is the actual intervention value that we considered for um, ATA calculation. We then learn the surrogate model, which is this line. Um, this is not linear because we're using some random Fourier features to actually learn nonlinear functions while using a linear uh, regressor. Um, and we can then simply plug in this conditioning value, which is two here, which is this dashed line, to then find the values of our surrogate function. We take the difference to get our Kate estimate, which is here 2.3 if we get the correct graph. And then on the other hand, it's 1.12 if we take the uh, wrong graph. And because we're doing this Monte Carlo estimate, we're then averaging them weighted by the probability of our graphs and get an estimate of a CAID, which is 1.8, which is actually decently close to what we got of our true CAID, which is 2.0. And this is kind of like to say, even though we got the wrong graph on one side and kind of like estimated a non-zero probability of the wrong graph, we can still achieve decent performance by using this model averaging and actually considering multiple models when our data does not give us exactly um, the correct graph in them. So to conclude a bit here, what we have is this deep end-to-end -end causal framework where we take some observational data as an input, we learn the causal relationships from that data as well as the functional relationships which are modeled as deep learning, uh, deep neural networks, and using both those things we can um, estimate causal quantities like average treatment effects, uh, conditional average treatment effects, and actually also counterfactuals and uh, individual treatment effects that I didn't actually mention here. Um, and using that, we are in the process of making real-world decisions to help yeah, people understand the scenario that they're working in.
Moreover, short teaser to Friday again at the Cause of Machine Learning for Real World Impact Workshop. We also have two more extensions uh, where we're looking into the scenario of unobserved confounding because obviously it's a big one. You will always or mo most often have unobserved confounders. Uh, where, for example, one easy example is when you're in a sales scenario, you will often have something like a market demand or a global economic situation that will be an unobserved confounder, especially in the world that we're currently in. Uh, we have some work that can tackle those scenarios that we're presenting there on Friday. And we have another extension that takes this model that we are currently, that currently talked about from this static setting, where you kind of like every variable is, or every column in your data set is a variable into a time series setting so that you can look at the evolution through time and see when a certain effect would appear and kind of like even make decisions of um, the matter of like, oh, am I interested in like the short term outcome or a long term outcome, which might actually mean you need to do different interactions and different interventions. Um, but yeah, we don't have too much on this here. Come please to the workshop on Friday and we can, we'll talk more about that there. Um, all together, what we're basically trying to do is take this traditional causal pipeline where usually you would have to specify a graph and need this domain knowledge, which often is not necessarily available when you especially work with like very high dimensional data sets where there's just too many of them to know um, or it's just unclear to and then go through this pipeline of like identifying the estimate and doing your causal inference estimation to a much more general end-to-end -end inference pipeline where we allow for incomplete prior knowledge. So you can say, oh, there should be an edge, um, or I'm 50% certain that there should be an edge. And um, also give us the statement that you don't know about other edges. And we will take this, learn the causal graph, learn the functions, and using this uh, deep generative model that we're training, we can then estimate average treatment effects, conditional average treatment effects, and ITEs, and then make decisions that are impactful in the real world. So thanks a lot for coming. Um, short teaser again, we are having the workshop running on Friday in rooms 295 to 296. And we're also having um, an open job posting for a senior researcher if anybody is interested in that. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> I can take it. <laughs> so, so I think the question is in business settings, first, like how, in general, how important is a causal graph? And, uh, and it's separate to how important is a skeleton and how important is a orientation, right? <laughs> so in general, it is very important because uh, you want to learn the SEM. So you want to know what is cause, what is effect first, whether these factors are even related. So it is very important to learn the graph. But in real world, the graph most of the time is not even available. So there is no domain expert, especially in some of the settings we're dealing with. There are hundreds, even thousands of variables. You can think about, like in Microsoft, we actually have hundreds of programs to, to really help and support our customers and partners. So in these settings, no one, no domain expert can give you the full call graph. So it's extremely important we develop an algorithm that can like, find this graph automatically. And so we have the graph then use the graph or partial the graph information, then we can estimate the treatment effect. And this graph needs to have both the skeleton and the orientation. <laughs> I guess one more short addition to that potentially is um, depending on your interest of like, what is your intervention variable, what's your effect variable, there might be some scenario where it's not as important if it's kind of like completely detached from the causal path between those two variables. Um, but you won't notice unless you have the graph. So in that direction, it is important to learn and um, get some insights there. Yeah, it's like uh, being sunny and uh, eating ice cream. <laughs> so you definitely need to know like it's, uh, the being sunny is a cause and eating ice cream is the effect. I mean, we're from UK, it doesn't matter how much ice cream we eat, it will not have the temperature like this. <laughs> Simon. And, yeah, I was just going to ask about, uh, I like the flow you presented at the end and the, the solving the problem. Okay. Don't need to specify. Don't
Um, uh, but, but it's very much what seems to provide a, a bit of a prior knowledge, and then, and then it was just sort of Have you thought about yet how you could incorporate into the inevitable updates from experts? Because they won't provide you with the stuff you need at the beginning, they will definitely provide you with the feedback once you've already done your hard work uh, on how wrong it is. So, you know, so how do you kind of incorporate that into the flow? So the question is whether we thought about how we would incorporate ongoing feedback from experts when we've, once we've actually learned the graph. And basically, I think we had a short presentation on something related yesterday and there's kind of like this whole toolkit that we are trying to provide at Microsoft, collaborating with teams in, um, well, Redmond, uh, New England and India. They're, they're, the idea is packaging up what we have as well as some like uh, graphical tools where you can provide feedback on a graph that kind of like we find and you can say oh this edge should be there or oh this should be like a treatment variable or this is an effect variable or this is somewhere in between. So this is kind of like one way that we think about it actually providing graphical user interfaces so that people can directly interact with this output in the graph. Um, and then also have some sliders on there, for example, to actually look at treatment effects. So this is kind of like one way to think about it. On the other hand, this is something that we're currently not using in our business applications, simply because we have hundreds of variables and actually having like a full graph of hundreds of variables, even though we have a really nice graphical user interface, is not very straightforward. So what we're rather doing there is looking at interesting parts in the graph and looking at single edges, basically. And we are then building questionnaires where we would say, oh, do you think that this variable and that variable are related, and A causes B, or B causes A, or whether there is a relationship or not, and then kind of like attaching certainties to that as well. And um, I think it's a very important question also. How do you actually get this feedback in a decent way, and how do you present it to, you, to users? And we don't have the answer yet, but we'll think about it. And, um, yeah, have some first approaches to that. I just want to add a little bit, like this is relating to the question. I mean, we also work in the education domain. And actually, we're actually running a competition for the education domain as well, because it's a really important, socially important domain where we can find the causal relationship between topics so teachers can get inspired. So this is a collaboration with actually ED and Oxford University Press. We're running smart curriculum with a causal graph. I mean, it's research. We provide useful insight, uh, insights, but we also make mistakes. So we have find really interesting insights that we find out the Vine diagram. In UK, it's taught much later. And then we find out it's, it's a topic in year 11, and it's a cause for many topics in year 10. And then we realize people already use that to, to uh, kind of design questions before even teaching the student. So this is an interactive process. Like we give this to the domain expert, they think about it, and whether it's valid, so they change the curriculum. But of course, they also give us feedback for some other insights we gave, it's wrong. So we build it as a new prior and retrain the model. So definitely in causality, working with people is extremely important. It's across all different domains, and many of these applications have a great social impact. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, thank you, everyone. <laughs> yep, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.